Hello and welcome to session one of the CryptoSense training on cryptography and cryptography risk. Here we're going to teach you about cryptography from the point of view of the things that can go wrong. So let's see what this course is all about. So cryptography is the cornerstone of security in IT infrastructure everywhere. These days we're always encrypting data, we're authenticating people with uh, cryptographic operations like signature and so on. We're using uh, hash functions everywhere to do authentication with HMAC to compress documents we want to sign. Cryptography is really everywhere in modern IT, whether it's on-prem, in the cloud, or in infinite, uh, internet of things. Mm -hmm. Cryptography risk is the danger of something bad happening if the cryptography doesn't work as it should do. And so in this course, we're going to teach you about cryptography from the point of view of crypto risk. It's like learning about how to build a bridge by finding out about why it is that bridges fall down. And this will be helpful if you're looking to put into place guidelines or uh, tooling in uh, DevOps pipelines, for example, to make sure that uh, your organization is implementing cryptography properly, no matter what cryptographic technologies or libraries or services it is that you're using. So cryptography really is everywhere. I remember once when I went to see a CEO of a large technology storage company, and uh, he asked what my company did. And he said, oh, okay, that sounds interesting, but uh, we don't use cryptography. Uh, and the reason people say that sometimes is they think about cryptography in their core business processes. So is that really the core thing that my technology does? But even if my technology is not a cryptographic technology, so it's not a signature system or a, a blockchain, I don't know, we've actually still got cryptography everywhere because we're always using public key infrastructure and VPNs and we're logging in with certain credentials that have to be checked cryptographically. We're using cryptography everywhere, even just in ordinary office IT that we might be using to run our company. So even if our company doesn't deliver a product that is full of cryptography to deliver its value, in fact, inside our IT, we've got cryptography everywhere, and we need all of that to be secure if we actually want to get the security in our system that we actually want to have. Another question what we ask sometimes around crypto risk is, are crypto attacks really a threat? So is it not the case that an attacker will look for an easier way to get into my system than uh, going around my cryptography. Uh, and maybe this, this crypto attack stuff is really just something that state level attackers uh, might do. So it, it's definitely the case that state level attackers previously were where you found this kind of expertise. But over time, the expertise necessary to uh, either break weak cryptography or go around cryptography that's not been used properly has become a mainstream hacking skill. So for example, if you go to the Black Hat conference and you opt for uh, taking some of their uh, usually excellent training uh, sessions, cryptography and how to break it is now one of the 12 categories of training that you can get alongside the other more classical security trainings. That's because it really is a mainstream skill now. And since the mid 2010s, really applicable cryptography attacks have started to appear in the academic literature. So prior to that, a lot of academic work about cryptography was rather theoretical around breaking particular schemes that might not even be implemented anywhere. But since this phase in the 2010s, there have been a lot of research come out that really shows you how to break cryptography that we're using right now. So those examples I give there, like Freak and, and Logjam, those are attacks on uh, the TLS protocol that we're using all the time to secure our web browsing and, and lots of other stuff that we do on the internet. It's probably the most widely used cryptographic protocol. So now you can just read academic literature and find usable attacks that you can put into practice on genuine, really widely used systems. And there are a famous set of challenges for breaking a cryptography or going around bad cryptography that were put together by a company called Matazano. This was a consulting company that was uh, using these primarily for recruiting. Um, it's now taken over by NCC. But these challenges are still available at CryptoPowers.org. And there's dozens of examples you can go through there and you can find forums where people discuss solutions and ways to do them. Uh, and, and you can really get a pretty thorough expertise. So this stuff is now really in, in the public domain. It's no longer just a nation state attacker skill. So people generally, when they think about cryptography, they think about that nice green padlock that they see in the web browser when they're uh, using the TLS protocol to visit a website uh, with security. Um, but if cryptography, uh, it can be thought of as a lock, like a padlock like this, it really shouldn't be just a simple uh, green padlock like this. Cryptography really resembles more um, a padlock like, like this one. So this is a lock on a chest in a, uh, a sort of uh, castle that you can go and visit 
uh, in Belgium. And all of these little levers uh, have to work together in exactly the right way in order for this uh, lock to open and, and for you to get access to it. Uh, and it, that's really a little bit more like how cryptography is. There's lots of moving parts that have to move in exactly the right way. Uh, but they're not physical parts, of course. They are parts of the design and the execution and implementation and configuration of the algorithms that you use. So you need to have random number generator running right. You need to configure protocols right. You need to choose the right modes and algorithms. You have to manage the keys correctly. You've got to make sure your operations don't interact together badly. And all of these aspects, if they go slightly wrong, they don't just lose you 10% of your security. They'll lose you typically all of your security. And these things really go wrong in practice. So we've put some examples here of real breaches or real uh, vulnerability disclosures that uh, include faults in these particular aspects of the way that the cryptographic system was put together. And so what we're going to do in the rest of the talk is we're going to go through uh, each of those incidents and we're going to talk about what exactly went wrong in terms of the cryptography. How was it that an attacker was able to exploit it or get around it? What were the consequences for the organization involved? Uh, where else can we find that same problem? So some more examples. And then in the rest of this training course, which will be taking place and being released on YouTube over the next few weeks, so make sure you subscribe, we'll talk about how in detail to detect and avoid these problems, either by manually reviewing or by putting into place automated tooling that catches these sort of issues uh, and make sure you avoid these problems uh, in the future. So let's start with uh, key management. So key management is... At CryptoSense, we have a, a SaaS tool, the CryptoSense Analyzer platform that people upload cryptographic traces to and our tooling finds uh, errors and, and weaknesses in the cryptography in there. And in that tool, the data that we get shows us that it's actually key management is the category of vulnerability that we see the most often. And that's because key management is a difficult problem. It involves the creation of keys, the destruction of keys that we're not using anymore, making sure we distribute them to the right people, store them securely, Make sure they're used according to the right policy uh, and keeping backups, restoring those backups, maybe rolling over keys. So there's a nice quote here from Bruce Schneier, who's a, a famous security researcher and uh, wrote a, a number of seminal books on applied cryptography. Uh, key management is the hardest part of cryptography and often the Achilles heel of an otherwise secure system. And if you go to the main conference on cryptography, uh, which is uh, IACR uh, Crypto, so that's hosted in Santa Barbara every year uh, in August and has been for uh, about 40 years now, uh, you'll find very few papers about key management. Okay, So academic research tends to concern new algorithms and uh, modes and um, maybe new threat scenarios and proofs, but very rarely deals with key management. Typically, the papers start by saying, let's assume Alice and Bob share a secret key, and then we're going to do this, this, and that. But unfortunately, in practice, often that key wasn't as secret as it was meant to be. And that's the problems that happen uh, around key management. So as an example of this, uh, let's look at the, the breach that happened on the RSA Secure ID technology. So you might have seen an RSA Secure ID fob before. The way they work is there is a six-digit number on the screen. You can see one there. And that number turns over um, about every 30 seconds. And, and that counter on the left there that with those bars, the left of the number, that essentially mounts up as the time goes past till it reaches the top and then a new uh, number comes on. Uh, and you use this to, to log in, essentially for humans uh, to, to use as a second factor for authentication. So they type a password and also enter the six digits that are currently visible on their RSA key fob. And the server, if they type in the right number, will, will let them in. So how does this system work? Well, the server has to know what the number should be uh, on the RSA secure ID of the, the person who's trying to log in. And the way it works is that there is a key, there's a cryptographic key inside the secure ID and inside the server. And that key is more or less used to encrypt a timestamp. So what the time is now. And the first six digits of that result uh, decimalized are the six digits that display on the screen. So if I want to log in, I type in my six digits and my server knows who I am so it can repeat that calculation, can take my cryptographic key, encrypt the, the current uh, timestamp rounded to the nearest 30 seconds uh, and work out what the six digits should be. And if they're the same, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to let me in. So that relies on uh, the secret key or the seed value that's inside the RSA secure ID and the ones which are in the server are remaining uh, secret. Because if those uh, keys become public, anybody could encrypt the timestamp and figure out what the six digits are supposed to be for, for an RSA secure ID. 
So you'd think that these seed values would be kept pretty securely. But in uh, March 2011, RSA announced that there'd been a breach inside their network uh, happened through a classical kind of spear phishing uh, technique uh, and that there was been some, some issues. And for a while, it wasn't very clear whether the seed values had been stolen or not, but then it became very clear that they had been and they had to uh, reissue uh, 40 million uh, devices. And recently, in, in May 2021, a really nice article came out in Wired magazine uh, that explains really in detail the anatomy of how this uh, breach went down and how they got hold of these keys. Uh, that's definitely worth uh, checking out. Uh, so this was a severe problem for RSA. Uh, the people who took the keys were able to use them to make fake logins to systems inside Lockheed Martin, uh, which had very sensitive um, intellectual property in. And of course, this caused massive brand damage to, to RSA as well. Uh, followed by more things happened after that, but that there was definitely a, a sort of beginning of the end for the, the brand of, of RSA. And so we see this kind of weak key storage uh, with uh, keys which are recorded to disk in bad kinds of key stores. Even when keys are uh, stored inside dedicated hardware security modules or HSMs, we see misconfigurations that allow the keys to be stolen. So this key management issue, just keeping your keys secure, is one of the biggest uh, aspects of, of crypto risk. Okay, so a second major category for getting uh, things wrong in cryptography is random number generation. So random number generation is really, really vital to cryptography staying secure. Of course, when we think about random number generation and cryptography, we probably think about key generation. So if I'm generating a new secure key, of course, it needs to be generated in a secure random way so that nobody can guess what that key value is. But we also use random numbers in lots of other places in cryptography for blinding against side channel attacks, for sort values, for storing passwords, uh, for challenge response protocols, and a bunch of other places. Uh, and so there's a very nice uh, paper, uh, there's a paper called Random Number Generation is Too Important to be Left to Chance, which is a, a great paper for, a uh, great name for a paper in pseudo random number generation. Uh, this is actually a paper that dates right back to 1970 uh, by a guy called Robert Kogayu, who was also a, a physicist in the Manhattan Project uh, and a civil rights activist, uh, interestingly. Anyway, so random number generation is too important to be left to chance. Uh, however, it often is. So uh, here we have some examples of how we can detect weak random number generation. So this relies on a property of the RSA cryptographic system. So RSA cryptography relies on the fact that it's extremely difficult to factor the product of two very large prime numbers if I don't know what those large prime numbers are. So if I give you a number that is, in fact, the product of the two large primes, I say, go ahead and, and factor that number, work out what those primes are. Uh, there's no efficient algorithm for doing that. Uh, and there should be enough uh, primes available. So if I use a proper secure random number generator to back up my uh, random uh, prime generation, then I should never uh, have a problem where I accidentally include in my RSA public key, a prime number which is also included in someone else's uh, public key. So if I included just one prime uh, that was shared with someone else's key, I wouldn't necessarily know straight away because the key values wouldn't be the same. Uh, they Because the second prime would be a different one. And generally speaking, uh, because of the mass of RSA, it'd be very, very hard for me to figure out that these uh, two uh, numbers uh, were being uh, constructed from one shared prime. But if I calculate the greatest common divisor of these two uh, RSA public key, so public modulus that share a prime factor. Well, the greatest common divider is in fact going to be that shared prime. So that's going to allow me to factor uh, both of those uh, public keys. So this is an interesting way to attack a large number of RSA keys is to get a whole bunch of them, so millions and millions potentially, uh, and run a, an efficient GCD algorithm over all of them to see if they have a greatest common divisor, so see if there are any shared primes between those uh, moduli. And there's a very efficient way of doing this thanks to a method by Dan Bernstein. Uh, so in January 2020, 2012, uh, a couple of teams published results uh, of having done this to, towards the end of 2011 uh, at scale on RSA keys that they found on the internet. So remember, it shouldn't be the case that there are ever any shared uh, factors in these, these moduli. There's enough primes out there for everybody. It, it can only happen when random number generation isn't working properly. Uh, and what they found was, in fact, there were tens of thousands of keys being used on the internet to secure SSH login or to secure uh, TLS, um, so to identify websites. 
um, that were actually breakable by these uh, methods. So once you've got a, a shared modulus, a shared factor between two moduli, you can factor both of them. Uh, and so this, uh, we actually implemented this at CryptoSense as well. We did this against the SSH keys that were public on uh, GitHub repositories. Uh, and we actually found 677 uh, GitHub SSH keys that we could break, which actually won us a bunch of bug bounty that we ended up giving to Médecins Sans Frontières, but that's another story. Um, and then recently, so more recently, in 2016, uh, a group uh, that actually included um, Nadia Henninger from the original uh, research back in 2011, uh, re-ran this procedure again. So you can see they found way more keys on the internet. They found 81 million by this point that they could crawl, but there's still more or less the same proportion of them that they could uh, factor. So even though this problem was really highlighted and, and a lot of publicity happened about this, there was even a, an article in the New York Times in early 2012 about this. Uh, still in 2016, there was still this problem around. And you can bet if you'd repeated that experiment today, you would still find a whole bunch of RSA keys uh, you can break because of errors in their random number generation. So other things go wrong with random number generation as well. Sometimes um, this results in the same key being used in a lot of devices uh, and these become known. Uh, or sometimes the random number generations are actually deliberately backdoored. We'll get into that a bit later uh, in this training course. Uh, embedded devices sometimes don't pick up uh, entropy sources properly and so end up generating the same random numbers as every other device in their class and so on. So there's a lot of issues out there with random number generation. Okay, that's the first two aspects of crypto risk. Uh, so this is the end of part one uh, of the training. So in session two, we're going to cover more examples of crypto risk from around that uh, lock diagram, including uh, signature forgery through bad signature modes, the attack on Sony PlayStation 3, DRM, uh, the drown attack on TLS, the RBS Wallpay attack on the cash machine network uh, and the Flame uh, super malware. Uh, so stay with us for session two and don't forget to subscribe to the CryptSense YouTube channel. Mm -hmm.